Hello everyone, my name is Francisco Cunha. I'm the author of the book on the crash of Independent Air Flight 1851, which was the deadliest air disaster to occur in Portugal and took place on February 8, 1989. I made this small presentation to try to explain in a simple and straightforward way the reasons that led to the accident. It is my first ever attempt at this kind of work and I hope you find it informative enough. The following is a chronological sequence of the actions that led to the accident. These are listed in the order as they happened and not in any order of importance. It is intended for educational purposes only and does not intend to determine any blame or liability. Firstly, a brief introduction of the setting where the crash occurred. The Azores Islands are in the Atlantic Ocean, 750 miles southwest of Portugal. This location made them a popular stopover for flights crossing the North Atlantic. The Azores are an archipelago with nine islands. Santa Maria is located in the southeast, as seen outlined in red. A layout of Santa Maria. It is a relatively small island with a length of around 11 miles and a population of around 5,000 people. A view of Pico Alto, where the plane crashed. It is the highest location of the island, standing around 2,000 feet tall. Independent Air Flight 1851 was operated by a Boeing 707-320B and had 144 people aboard, 137 passengers and 7 crew. A picture of the plane in the Azores, two weeks before the accident. Independent Air Flight 1851 was a charter flight carrying Italian tourists to the Dominican Republic with a stopover in Santa Maria for refueling. Now to the sequence of events. First, the lack of an approach briefing. Before approaching Santa Maria Airport, Standard Operating Procedures, SOP for short, state that the crew should have conducted the so-called approach briefing, which would include reviewing the approach plates. Approach plates are charts that contain information pertinent to operation in the airports. In the image, a replica of an approach chart like the one aboard flight 1851. Investigation stated the crew did not perform the approach briefing that would include reviewing the approach plates. Among various information, the approach plate stated the MSA, the minimum sector altitude, for Santa Maria Island. The MSA denotes an altitude below which it is unsafe to fly owing to the presence of terrain or obstacles. In the case of Santa Maria, the minimum sector altitude was of 3,000 feet and the chart also denoted the elevation of Pico Alto near 2,000 feet, both of which can be seen outlined in red on the chart. This information was of particular significance to the first officer slash co-pilot of flight 1851, who was on his first flight to Santa Maria and was inexperienced in international routes. It should be noted that the first officer was handling radio communications and assisting the captain, who was flying the aircraft. The unauthorized VOR entry route After passing the Eco Point, 71 miles northeast from Santa Maria, Flight 1851 began its approach to the airport, using an entry route through the VOR Radio Navigation Aid, NAV8 for short. The VOR NAV8 route is shown in the figure in red. The correct approach procedure would have been instead to fly an entry route using the NDB, another nav in the airport, the route in yellow. Local authorities hadn't updated the aeronautical information publication, the so-called AIP, regarding the island since the 1960s. This meant that the AIP provided to the makers of the approach plates was outdated. As such, the charts did not state that the crews should not use the VOR on a northeast approach, as was the case of Flight 1851. Using a VOR for an entry route in an airport is a normal procedure, so it was usual for other flight crews to make similar approaches as the one made by Flight 1851. In this comparison of NDB and VOR entry routes, one can see that the authorized NDB course would lead the plane on a more northern heading, while the VOR route takes the plane over the elevation of Pico Alto, where the accident occurred, the area outlined in the circle. As seen in this northeastern view of the island, the significance of this action is that if the jet had flown the NDB route in green, it would have been over lower terrain and the sea. 
This would have provided enough clearance to the ground, regardless of the actions related to the altitude that followed. On the other hand, the VOR route, in red, would end up leading the airplane directly over peak wall. ATC transmits a descent clearance with an incorrect KNH. Basically, the KNH is a measure of barometric pressure that is used to set the airplane's barometric altimeter and is provided by air traffic control, ATC for short. An incorrect KNH figure will cause the altimeter to misread. In the example here, a pilot is cleared to 4000 feet, but due to an incorrect KNH, the plane is actually at 3700 feet, even though the altimeter will still read 4000 feet. One of the air traffic controllers in Santa Maria Tower radioed flight 1851 with a descent clearance which included a KNH of 1027, a figure which was incorrect and would lead to an altitude error of around 240 feet. It should be noted that 12 minutes before transmitting the incorrect KNH of 1027, the same air traffic controller working on a different ATC position, that of approach controller, had transmitted a correct KNH of 1019. A variation of 9 KNH in 12 minutes would only occur during extreme weather conditions, such as a tropical storm, which was not the case. The report noted issues with ATC procedures in Santa Maria. Check reports for more details. Communications overlaps between ATC and Independent Air 1851. In aviation communications, an overlap can be described as a simultaneous radio transmission between two or more stations on the same frequency. In this context, simultaneous is defined as transmissions that overlap in such a way that the controller is not aware that more than one transmission has occurred, leading to a potential safety hazard. Also of importance to explain this particular communication issue is the definition of readback. In aviation, it's a standard procedure to perform a readback of the message received. This is made so the receiver of the message can confirm you obtained the correct information from the station that transmitted the message. Referring once again to the communication we mentioned earlier, the controller issued a descent clearance to 3000 feet and briefly paused. During this pause, Flight 1851's first officer began to read back of what he incorrectly understood as a clearance to 2000 feet, while the controller continued to transmit his message, stating again a clearance to 3000 feet. Crucially, these two simultaneous transmissions overlapped each other. This meant that ATC did not hear the first officer read back of an incorrect clearance to 2000 feet and the jet screw did not receive, once again, ATC's correct descent clearance to 3000 feet. Incorrect setting of the altitude alert The altitude alert is an instrument that warns the crew before approaching or deviating from a target altitude. In this example, if the plane is descending and the alert is set to 4000 feet, the alert will sound at 4200 feet. This is 200 feet before reaching the target altitude. In the jet's cockpit, after receiving the ATC clearance to 3000 feet, the first officer repeated what he understood as a clearance to 2000 feet. Another crew member, likely the captain, corrected the figure to 3000 feet. Regardless, the first officer still set the altitude alert to 2000 feet. This meant that the jet was descending and instead of the crew being warned they were about to reach the minimum sector altitude of 3000 feet, the jet was now descending below that and the altitude warning would now sound near 2000 feet and not 3000. In this schematic comparing the descent to 3000 feet in green with the descent to 2000 feet in red, we can see that descending to 2000 feet will place the jet in an altitude much closer to the ridges of Picoalto. It's important to note that, at the time of the accident, the edge of Picoalto was involved in cloud cover, which we will detail shortly. Yet again, this leads to the importance of the approach briefing and reviewing the MSA of 3000 feet as seen in the shorts. Here, we can see a replica of the plane's altitude alert set at 2000 feet. It should be noted that the Board of Inquiry to Independent Air Flight 1851 listed that the deliberate descent to 2000 feet breaching MSA and ATC clearance, was considered by the air crash investigators as, quote, cause of the disaster. 
setting the altimeter with incorrect KNH. In the cockpit, the first officer briefly questioned the KNH figure of 1027 he had received from ATC. The captain confirmed to have heard the same figure in the radio. The first officer was likely surprised by the KNH change from 1019 to 1027 in just 12 minutes. Despite the discrepancy, he did not question ATC again to clear the issue. The combination of descent at 2000 feet and incorrect KNH will place the jet in a collision altitude with Pico Alto. Note the schematic on the left. Scenario A at the top shows the jet at 3000 feet with the correct KNH. Scenario B shows flight at 3000 feet with the incorrect KNH, where there wouldn't have been any major consequences. Scenario C displays airplane at 2000 feet and on correct KNH. Taking in account the jet's impact location, even with the trees on top of the crest, it can be presumed the aircraft would still have cleared the terrain. Scenario D, combining descent to 2000 feet with the incorrect KNH, placed the jet at around 1760 feet and the collision occurred at around 1795 feet. Investigators noted that the aircraft would always be in a dangerous situation when descending at 2000 feet leading us once again to the importance of the approach briefing. Lack of reaction to the ground proximity warning system, GPWS. The GPWS is a system that alerts flight crews of potentially hazardous proximity to terrain, as seen in this example. Investigation showed the GPWS sounded 7 seconds before impact, but the crew did not react by attempting a terrain evasion maneuver by pulling up the aircraft over the mountain. The reason for the crew's lack of reaction to the GPWS were related to the airline's equipment and crew training. Independent Air 707s had been fitted with ish kits on their engines, which are devices that lower the jet engine's noise so to comply with legal regulations. In the picture, you can see the hush kits on the 707 outline in red. One should note that installation of hush kits modifies the aircraft's flying characteristics. Investigators found the simulators used by Independent Air quote, were not programmed for the same approach speeds and flap settings as used by the accident aircraft because the simulators had not been modified with the installation of hush kits. Thus, because the simulator's GPWS would activate during normal approaches, instructors usually disabled the GPWS or instructed the students not to react when the GPWS would sound. This issue is described in detail in the report and was considered as an issue of supervision by authorities. Another factor was the presence of clouds over Pico Alto, which prevented the crew from visually detecting the terrain ahead when the alarm sounded. Back to the previous altitude schematic, we can see that by descending to 2000 feet red line, the jet was placed close to the edge of Pico Alto, which is covered by clouds, the area inside the white rectangle. Here we see again a picture of Pico Alto. This is a close-up of the area where the plane impacted. The same area, but pictured a few hours later with clouds covering the crest. Inside the cockpit, this is what the pilots of Flight 1851 would be seeing in the final seconds before impact. They were unable to use visual references and would not see the crest of the mountain in front of them. The report also notes that the GPWS sounded for 7 seconds and the medium reaction time to the alarm is 5.4 seconds, so the crew had time to react. According to several former Boeing 707 captains that were contacted in this matter, even if the crew had reacted, given factors such as the jet's handling characteristics, its proximity to the obstacle, human performance limitations and others, it's unsure if they would have saved the jet, even had they attempted an evasion maneuver. This leads once again to the fact that, by descending to 2000 feet, the jet was placed in a dangerous situation, which ultimately led to the accident. Moment of impact. Note the sudden drop and descent shown prior to the impact, as shown in the flight data recorder, FDR. Investigators stated that the drop and climb recorded were not as sudden as it seemed, being recorded as such due to the characteristics of the earlier type FDR used in the jet. This concludes this presentation. Links for more information are below in the video description. 
Keep in touch.